Hi, so this time I want to share with you my birth story um, that happened with my daughter. So my number one <laughs> birth story, my first child. Um, with my daughter, I ended up, um, it was, you know, she's my first child. I've never even been in a hospital before. Well, except for when we took a tour of it, <laughs> I guess, if that counts. But I, I did my best to try to kind of research and you know but there's a lot of things I didn't know about it um, the things I kind of focused on were like finding the most natural prenatal vitamins you know and I didn't know who doulas were I probably have heard of midwives at that point but I think I didn't I didn't I thought they like were the people that were in your home if you were to have your baby at home I didn't know that there were any that delivered at hospitals so I didn't really know the whole natural aspect of it, of things. And I just kind of planned, I, you know, I went to my doctors and just kind of thought that they would <laughs> guide me along and everything would go well. Um, now, let me tell you real quick that in the United States, one out of every three women ends up having a C-section. So just some statistics to keep in mind. They told me that at the birthing class. And as they told me that, I was sitting there and I was just kind of thinking like, oh, look to the person to your right and to your left. One of you is going to have a C-section. Um, and I plan on having an all-natural birth um, without, you know, any uh, pain medication and stuff. So I was like, I just, I, it's not going to be me. It's not, I'm not going to be, you know, one of them. Um, it's going to be one of the other two people. And um, what happened once I started approaching my due date is you go more often to your doctor and I went for um, a checkup. I was almost 39 weeks, like a few days short of 39 weeks and they measured my blood pressure and it was really high. So up until that point, everything went perfectly normal. But then on that, you know, on that day, my blood pressure was kind of high. And I, it was morning, I didn't really have time to eat breakfast because I'm constantly running late and I like to sleep in and, you know, I, I didn't have any children at that time so I could sleep in. And I just had like a handful of raspberries. <laughs> that was my food. And that would end up being my food for the next, I don't know how many days. <laughs> so um, they decided to put the little monitors on my belly that they had in the doctor's office and monitor the baby, um, baby's heartbeat. But the baby kept moving and they kept having to adjust the thing and adjust it and adjust it. And they're like, okay, well, um, the monitors at the hospital are much better. So you just need to go to the hospital. We need to monitor the baby because your blood pressure is high. So, you know, you're gonna have to go to the hospital. So I called my, um, I called my husband and he met me at the hospital. And, you know, they hooked me up to everything. And my blood pressure, because I was lying down in the bed for a while there, hooked up. I mean, everything's hooked up by wires. You can't really get up and move. So I was lying down and my blood pressure actually went down to like perfectly normal blood pressure. Like the ideal blood pressure, like it dropped significantly. So then I was like, okay, so I'm good. I just needed to rest or something. Maybe I like walked around too much. I don't know. Because the thing they worry about is preeclampsia. Pre um, which can be really bad for you if you get that. But I obviously didn't have that because there's other signs of it. Like you have protein in your urine and you have other things. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have any of those other things, but they were still worried um, because of the blood pressure. So it went down and I thought that they would let me go home <laughs> at that point. But I was wrong because the doctor came in um, and there was a whole bunch of doctors that I was seeing at that practice. And there's I mean, I liked them all, but you know, you have favorites and you're like, I hope she delivers my baby <laughs> or like, I hope she delivers my baby. But, um, there was one that it's not that I didn't like her. She's a good doctor, but she's just not like the softest, sweetest person. She's more like, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but, um, I just didn't feel like as comfortable with her. And of course she was the one that happened to be on call. And she came in and she's like, well, we looking at all your things that we've been measuring, your um, baby's heartbeat, you know, is good. But then there was one time when it like dropped or something and then went back up. And later the nurse told me that that's normal because I was like, what, <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and she's like, that's normal that your baby can just like grab the umbilical cord and squeeze it or something and then, you know, let it go. And so it's, 
if we like measure your baby throughout your entire pregnancy, you would see that happening um, periodically. So, but the feeling that I got from my doctor, and they didn't tell me this flat out, but by talking to her, like I'm pretty sure this is what was happening. Um, they did not want to let me go home because it, because of that, you know, one little drop, if anything were to happen, they were afraid of getting sued. You know, if, if I went home and then something went wrong with the baby, even though things were completely fine, they, you know, they're afraid of any liability that they would experience as a result of letting me go home. It was much more beneficial to them to deliver my baby ASAP and, you know, not have to worry about that whole side of things. Um, and also because it was measuring contractions, the, um, monitor thing. I wasn't feeling any contractions at that point. Um, but I guess a lot of times you are experiencing some really weak ones that you may not feel, or that may feel like Braxton Hicks and that maybe that's what they are. But she's like, Oh, you're having pretty regular contractions. I was like, I don't even feel anything. And she's like, no, no, they're there. They're just weak or something. So you can't feel them. So, you know, the, the baby is, you know, trying to be born. I think we'll just give you a little bit of Pitocin and then you're going to have this baby, you know, really soon and everything's going to be, you know, really great. Um, and so, I was really scared because, you know, being a new parent and never being in that situation ever before. And my husband, you know, was also probably scared. And so I tried to talk them into letting me go home, but they were kind of really against it and really pushing um, to have me induced, which is something I... It was not in my plan at all because I wanted things to progress on their own and naturally. And obviously the baby wasn't ready if I wasn't in labor yet, um, despite of these, you know, fake little weak contractions that I'm supposedly having. Obviously the baby's not ready. Um, but basically I was kind of pressured into having a um, induction and to have in the Pitocin. And looking back on it, um, I was just so scared and nervous that it was just like, okay, you're the doctors, you know better. But looking back on it, um, a hospital is not jail. They cannot force you to stay there, especially if, you know, you're not in labor, you're, you don't have your, my blood pressure went back down. I think that if I really insisted and I got up and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm leaving, I probably could have left, but that wasn't on my mind at the time. It's not really something that crossed my mind to do because I was just nervous, but you know, if you're ever in that situation, I, I don't want to tell you to do that because there's obviously some, some risks involved with that as well. But I just want you to kind of think about the whole situation and consider the pros and cons. Because if I had known everything at that point, I would have personally left and waited until the baby was ready and I went into labor on my own. But instead I was induced and that whole entire day, so my appointment was in the morning. This was all still happening in the morning. Um, they wouldn't let me eat um, or drink and until a little bit later. They let me have water. But I was like starving to death. And they're like, no, you can't until you have the baby. You can't eat anything. And so um, I was induced and I was on Pitocin that rest of that day and that entire night. And nothing was happening at all. <laughs> I was not having like stronger contraction. I wasn't feeling anything. And the next morning... Um, it was a different doctor because they had switched shifts and it was a man. Um, so he came in and I was like, can I go home? <laughs> Nothing is happening. Can you just like unhook me and let me go home? And, but he's like, no, <laughs> no, you're not going home. Um, he, he waited like a little bit longer, but then he was like, I think we need to break your water because the Pitocin isn't, you know, really getting things started like we thought that it would, like I was promised that it would. So he ended up breaking my water and there was um, meconium in it, which means that um, it's the baby's first poop is what it is. Sorry, <laughs> that's gross too, but it's basically, it's not clear. The liquid is not clear and that's how they can tell. Um, and that is bad because A, it's a sign of stress. It happens when the baby's stressed. Um, B, the baby can inhale. They have that liquid that they're swimming in. They actually, they breathe that in and they swallow it. 
um, and it's in their lungs, but if there's the, the poop in there and then they breathe it in, then that's bad. That's really bad for the baby. So the baby was stressed and there was that risk of the baby breathing it in. So that, that wasn't very good and that made me really nervous. Um, but breaking my water did start off my contractions and because they literally pumped me full of Pitocin for the past day and night, um, when my contractions started for real, um, they were so bad and they were like, oh, well, this is just the start of it. It's going to get a lot worse. So if you need an epidural, tell us now because it's going to take a while. We have to give you fluids and it's going to take like an hour to get it set up. So I was like, I didn't want to have one. Um, you know, initially I wanted everything to go naturally, but when I was experiencing the pain that I was experiencing and they were telling me like, oh, this is nothing. It's going to get like a hundred times worth. This is just the start of it. Um, I guess I found that really discouraging and I was like, well, I don't think that I can do this without the drugs. And so I ended up getting an epidural and uh, what I had heard and read afterwards is that Pitocin induced contractions because they're not your body's natural contractions. A lot of times they're a lot stronger and a lot more painful. So, um, perhaps that's why they felt so strong to me, even though it was just the beginning of them. So, um, I got an epidural and that made they wouldn't let me get out of bed and I was really, really uncomfortable laying on my back and I kept asking to please like at least let me lie on my side and they're like, no, or let me sit up a little bit and they're like, no, you should really be flat on your back lying down for the epidural to work properly, blah, 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 blah. So that was terrible. They still weren't letting me eat. I was like, felt like I was gonna starve to death <laughs> and I wish I had a bigger breakfast than the raspberries and um, still not much was happening. Um, I could sort of feel the contractions a little bit through the epidural, but they weren't painful. But finally, later that night, um, I got to the point where they told me, because I wasn't feeling the urge to push or anything due to the epidural, but they told me that, um, I was dilated fully and I could start pushing. So I was like, okay, great. Um, and I pushed for, um, three hours and, um, nothing really happened. Um, I wasn't successful. They, you know, they didn't have, like, if you saw my other birth, birth story where I had the midwife that, you know, had all these suggestions and ideas and helpful, <laughs> helpful tips to help me, um, in this setting, because I had a doctor, not a midwife, it was just kind of like push, you know, <laughs> like you let it happen. I'm going to catch the baby. And so it just, it wasn't working. I mean, I wasn't feeling the urge to push. They had to tell me when to push by looking at the monitors to see when my contractions were happening. And it was just really frustrating that I couldn't do it. And they let me do it for, you know, I guess as long as they could because three hours is a long time and I was having a fever and they were concerned about an infection. And I guess the baby was showing signs of distress and so the, um, the doctor was like, we are really going to have to give you a C-section now. And I was like, no, because that like, that was like the last thing that I wanted to have. If I had to have some interventions, fine. But a C-section, my God, it's like a major surgery. And I was so scared. I had never had anything like that. Um, I mean, I had my wisdom teeth out, but I didn't go under a general anesthesia because I'm like terrified of that. So when I had my wisdom teeth out, I just had like shots of no, no, no Novocaine and I like sucked it up. <laughs> so I was like, no, no, no. Can I push like one last time? And they're like, okay, push one last time. And I was like, come on, baby, please come out of me. Um, but she didn't. And they ended up, um, you know, having to do a C-section, which sucked because I had been in the hospital for so long and I had gone through so much and I gone through entirely, like pretty much a full labor, you know, with pushing and still I ended up with a C-section. It's one thing if you just go in there, you know, well rested in the morning and you have your C-section, but I had gone through the whole labor and I still had to have a C-section and that was like extra frustrating to me. But anyways, um, my daughter was born and she wasn't doing very well. She had a pretty low Abgar score and she wasn't breathing. So I didn't get to see her. They rushed her out right away and they kind of had to like resuscitate her. And, um, I, I don't know, I think they just gave me too many drugs because I passed out, um, after the C-section happened. And so I guess from having my husband tell me the story is they stitched me up and brought me to the recovery room and I was in the recovery room for two hours. And then by then I gained consciousness and then they rolled me into 
um, you know, the room where I would be staying with the baby. And then they brought me my baby. And so she did um, want to feed, um, unlike my son, who just did, was not interested in eating for the first like 12 hours. Um, she did want to feed and I had a lactation consultant come help me and we were having a lot of trouble with her latching on properly because I'm pretty sure since um, it's been, you know, a few hours that they gave her, um, my mother-in-law said that they most likely, because she used to work um, in that like department she used to work be like a nurse that works with with babies after they're delivered and she's like I guarantee you they gave her like sugar water or something or formula so because of that she latched on for the first time in her life to a um, fake rubber nipple you know on a bottle and not me and so she her latch started off being wrong and so had a lot of trouble getting her to um, you know eat properly, <laughs> to breastfeed properly. Um, but the lactation consultants came and they helped me every single day that I was there. They came in several times and helped me and we worked on it and it was extremely painful. Um, not to get all like graphic on you or anything, but um, I was bleeding and it was just bad. <laughs> but I ended up sucking it up because it was literally like I was thinking to myself, this is the last thing that I have left that can possibly, you know, still go right. Everything else went the opposite of my plan. Um, this is the last like natural thing that if I can suck it up and do this, like then, then at least I will have this because I obviously I wanted to breastfeed. And if I were to give up and end up formula feed, feeding her, then it would have been like hundred percent. Everything went the opposite of my plan. So I was like, I don't care if I have to cry because <laughs> I had to cry every single time that I would feed her because it would hurt so much. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do it. I'm going to cry and I'm just going to like suck it up and breastfeed her. And I did. I did. It was, it was hard, but I did. And I'm super proud of myself because I ended up nursing her for 13 months. And even then, it wasn't because I weaned her off. It was because she herself started refusing to nurse and she weaned herself off. I actually wanted to, it was, she was born in the winter and um, breast milk provides babies protection from getting sick because you give them your antibodies. If there's like any cold going around and you're exposed to it, you would give baby the antibodies and baby wouldn't catch it. So um, I wanted to feed her through the winter, through like flu season, you know, um, but she just weaned herself in, um, which was born in December. So like January, I fed her through January and she just weaned herself. Um, but it did get a lot like to give you encouragement. If you're going through the same thing with breastfeeding, um, and you just stick it out, it does get better. Um, after about three months, um, is when it got better for me and it was still uncomfortable, but no longer, you know, I wasn't crying every time I fed her. It was no longer, I wouldn't describe it as painful. I just describe it as really uncomfortable. And it got better from there, but it, breastfeeding for me, like to some people, they're like, oh, I just like sleep at night and my baby breastfeeds. And I could never sleep through it because even when it doesn't hurt and it got to that point where like it was fine, it was still like, it still felt weird. I could never sleep through that, but I guess some people can. And I mean, that's great <laughs> for them because I would have loved to, <laughs> to sleep, to keep sleeping at night. Um, but I do want to encourage you that it does get better. Um, and it's worth sticking it out because it's so good for your baby and it's so good for you. It actually reduces your risk of getting breast cancer. So um, that was the one thing that went right for me <laughs> with my um, birth of my daughter. And she ended up um, recovering. She ended up being fine. You know, they, she started breathing. They obviously, you know, helped her breathe and all that stuff. And then she was fine. She didn't have any, you know, um, like after effects of it or anything of the traumatic birth. Um, except for maybe, um, I haven't had my son, you know, in a lot of like a less traumatic way <laughs> than I had my daughter. Um, he is like super calm compared to her. She would cry all night um, long after she was born and you would feed her, you would change her, you would hold her, you would just do anything that you possibly thought, you know, swaddle, unswaddle, maybe she's too hot, maybe she's too cold. You just do everything that you can think of that would make her comfortable and she would just scream, just like bloody murder, just scream all night long. And 
a lot of times we couldn't get her to calm down and fall asleep until like three in the morning at least. So um, I don't know if it was colic. I mean, this happens with some babies. They call it like purple crying or something because sometimes they cry so hard their face turns purple. Um, but I would just try my best and, you know, a worse you know, worst situation, I would just hold her and she would scream and cry, but at least like I was holding her and loving her and, and trying to get her to calm down, even though she wouldn't. So I wonder if that had anything to do with the traumatic birth that she experienced and also her being born a little bit early because from what I understand, colic is linked to your digestive system. A lot of times babies, um, their tummies hurt essentially, you know, after they eat um, because they're digestive system um, isn't completely 100% functioning perfectly yet and so they like they get like gas pains they get all kinds of pains um, and then they, they cry and so I wonder if because she was born a little bit earlier than she probably normally would have been because I was induced if that you know she just wasn't ready yet and she wasn't fully developed her belly you know wasn't ready and that she was experiencing some discomfort and pain and that's why she would cry so hard I don't know I, um, but I can't help think that it potentially was linked to um, her birth. And I also, for the longest time, I would look back on it and I kept thinking like, if only I didn't let them induce me, you know, if only I had walked away or, you know, or even if the doctor has been like, okay, well, let me lie down and then you can check my blood pressure later. Or let me come back and then you can check my blood pressure later. I don't know what would have happened, but it was something that had already happened. I couldn't go back in the past and change that, but it was something that kind of haunted me for a long time. And it probably wasn't until recently that I feel like I really came to terms with, you know, there's nothing I can do. It happened and I just need to get over it and move on because looking at it and dwelling on it is not gonna change anything and it's not gonna help. Um, and I also experienced some symptoms of postpartum depression. Um, it was partially due to that. It was, you know, like kind of mourning um, the birth <laughs> that I didn't have, you know. Um, but it was also, I just, I couldn't help feeling sad. Uh, for somebody that is generally happy most of the time, I just, I couldn't fight the feelings of sadness that I was experiencing with my daughter. And I couldn't help crying over everything. I didn't want to cry. But it's like I was always on that, on like the verge of crying. Any little thing that, you know, could potentially make you sad would just happen and I would start crying. You know, from like sad commercials on TV to just not being able to like hearing my daughter cry and not being able to get her to stop crying. You know, I would just like cry along with her. Um, and it was just like a really rough time for me. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and just having this like feeling of just like complete despair. And... Um, I, I got through it. I mean, it was definitely not as bad as some people experience it for sure. So I don't know if it was, you know, postpartum depression or just some kind of like mild form of it. Um, but um, I got through it. And I mean, I'm sure like the um, frustration from the breastfeeding not working too well that got to me as well. Um, but I got through it and I forget how many months it took. But um, after maybe three or six months, at some point I started feeling better. And I just wanted to say, I mentioned this, if you saw my son's birth story, my number two <laughs> birth story, um, I got some pills made out of my placenta, which animals eat their placenta um, after they have their babies, but humans obviously don't. Um, but the service that I got was this um, super nice lady. She um, dehydrated my placenta, ground it down to a powder, and made me pills to take. Because when you lose your placenta, you lose a lot of hormones and just a lot of things all at once. And it's just like a huge hormonal shift for your body. And that's why a lot of people do experience symptoms of postpartum depression. And so when you put those in slowly by taking the pills, you know, slowly back into your body, that kind of really helps for a lot of people. Obviously everyone's different, but it helps to regulate that. And I just want to say that with my son, it helped me a ton, like a ton. And I just highly, highly recommend it. So I just want to mention it here while I'm talking about the postpartum aspect of things. Um, but that's pretty much it. That's my entire birth story. 
um, with my daughter and I do want to say if you haven't seen my other video that I did end up having a successful vaginal birth um, with my son um, after this you know first c-section and he was bigger he was a pound bigger uh, one concern they had with my daughter while why I couldn't you know push her out is um, misproportion of the size of my pelvis and my hips and the size of her um, but you know my son was a whole pound bigger and he was just as long and his head was just as big and I was able to have him vaginally so I just want to mention that part uh, at the end of this video in case you experienced a similar birth story the first time around I just want to mention I um, I just want to give you kind of hope that you, you don't have to um, you know be in the mindset okay I will have to have c-sections now if I want to have any more children because if you don't want to and you want to try to have your baby naturally the second time around it's definitely up to you but it can be done and obviously there's some circumstances where some people may need a c-section a second time around emergency things always come up there's things that are out of our control um, but if you want to try then I just want to give you encouragement and hope that you know I was able to do it and I hope that you know my story inspires you and gives you hope that you know maybe you can do it too if you want to try so um, that's it and that's you know it's primarily my purpose of sharing this story with you I also want you to be kind of more aware of all the things that happen in a hospital and the high rate of c-sections that happens in the United States and a lot of times it's caused by all the interventions that people have by being induced by having an epidural and obviously some people can be induced and have an epidural and still have their baby naturally but having all these interventions increases your chances of having a c-section so um, I I just want you to do your research and be aware so that you can make the right decisions so that you don't have to be like me and look back on it and regret you know if only I could have walked away you know and not you know being forced to be induced <laughs> so um, that's why I wanted to share my story with you and I thank you very much for watching this and I hope that you know this will help you at some point or if not maybe this was interesting for you to watch so thank you so much. Bye.